Um, yeah, uh, wanted to go over um, feedback loops, which is a very core concept in uh, control system <coughs> programming, so programming robots, basically. Um, who here has heard of a functional block diagram? The gist of a functional block diagram is you have <coughs> some, you have a bunch of blocks which act as functions. So they have certain inputs, certain outputs, and you can connect them together, and it's a way of representing um, how some system works. So if you are familiar with digital logic, you may be familiar with AND gates, which have two or more inputs and one output, and so AND OR gates, and you can connect those together to, to represent different computations, etc. This is a similar idea, but more generalized. So a feedback loop is, in general, Yes. You have some, one more, sensors on the robot which give you some data about the robot or some mechanism on it, etc. You, that data is put through some sort of computation which gives you some output, you, often to an electric motor, and then dotted lines represent something that you don't control, like that's just laws of physics at that point. That affects the physical state of the robot, which then affects the sensor. You are trying to set something up here based on what sensors you can get here and what output you have control over here so that you can control the physical state of the system in some way. An example, which I'll use for the uh, majority of this, is you have a, a, sim a single joint robotic arm which, which you're using to hold something in the air or move something up and down, etc. In that case, the input from the sensor is just a single value telling you what angle the arm is at. The output is just a voltage that you're applying across the electric motor. Um, and yeah, and you're trying to, say in this case, we're trying to get it to a certain position. So we want it to hold the arm at like 30 degrees above horizontal. The question is, what do we put in here in this question mark box? The simplest, most naive thing that we can put is, um, uh, let me put another sort of input here, actually in this case a constant or something coming from other part of the code. Target, where do we want the arm to be? So if we, the simplest, most naive thing is we subtract these, maybe multiply by some constant, I'm going to call it kp and you'll see where that comes from later, um, and that's our output. So why might that work? So, say the arm is currently at horizontal, we're trying to get it to 30 degrees. So, target is 30, current value is um, 0, and so 30 minus 0 will give us 0. 30 minus 0 will give us 30. Yeah, for, for, for you said 0. You said 0, yeah. It's been a long day. <laughs> um, just make let's it. say kp equals 1, just as an example. So, that means that when it's at horizontal, we'll be applying say 30 volts across the motor in the direction that will make it spin uh, so the arm moves up. Then, maybe next time we do this calculation, it's at 29, or it's one degree above horizontal, so then 30 minus one gives us 29. So we're now applying 29 volts across the motor and so forth. Um, and the, the point is eventually as we get to the motor, or sorry, to the target position, the voltage across the motor will end up being zero, right? Uh, and if we were to ever, over, like, if this works regardless where we start, if we start above 30, if we start at 45, it'll start trying to force the arm down, right? Uh, say it gets there and someone bumps into it and hits it down, it'll go back up if we have this continuing run, right? Make sense? Can anyone think of any reason why this wouldn't work perfectly? Any way it could go wrong? Yes? If it's too aggressive when it's trying to hit that target point, it'll kind of vibrate back and forth. Precisely. So we, we usually call that oscillation. Even if this is ideal, you can still get oscillations. But the other reason why that shows up is uh, that <coughs> this does not happen, or a change here does not instantaneously affect this. Right? There's a bit of a time delay. The CPU on your robot will take a non-zero amount of time to do these calculations. Um, the electronics will take a non zero amount of time to change what the voltage across the motor is. Um, motor, the motor's velocity will not change immediately when you change the voltage. There's a, there's a 
lag at every stage. So if you say, okay, um, like if you're approaching the um, if you're approaching the target and you're telling it to drop the voltage, it may still be applying a, a significant amount of voltage across the motor when it hits that target. The motor may still be trying to move up when it hits the target. So you need to react to that. So that is another thing that we can do. Um, so let me do that further down, uh, which is that let's do. We were to take the derivative of this error. By the way, this value in the middle here we call error, so it's the difference between where we want to be and where we are. So if we were to take the derivative of the error, and again, we multiply by some value. Let me change this to now. So I'm just going to add those back together. So if we were to take the derivative of the error and multiply that in, how does that help us? So we would set that up in such a way that the faster we are moving towards the target, the less we try to move towards the target. Does that make sense? So if uh, now we've differentiated between two cases. One is, say, we are at 0 and we're trying to get to 30, and, um, and we're stationary. That's now treated differently from we're at 0 and we're trying to get to 30, but we start at negative 20, so we're already moving. We already have momentum, right? Because those cases are different, so that now we're handling them differently. Uh, and that also um, that respects the fact that the uh, robot has, or the, the mechanism has mom um, momentum and inertia, right? Okay. Any other issue with the system, even with the current setup? So, has anyone heard the term steady state error before? Okay, cool. Uh, so, steady state error is where. Um, there, so this, the error value is not zero, but it's not changing. So how could that arise in the system? Well, presumably, like this is like this arm is operating in some scenario where there is gravity and or friction. I mean, we could have this on something that's purely horizontal, so gravity doesn't have a direct effect on it, but there would still be friction. So what that means is it's possible to get to a certain point. Um, let's say we have something where we didn't I'm just do this over here. We didn't set up completely properly, and we did get some oscillation. Did, did anyone ever do the experiment in high school physics where you had a spring and something oscillating, but it was on the surface, so it had friction? Would stop? At, or would that block stop at the exact point um, where the spring was exerting zero force? No, right? It would stop at the point where the force that the spring is exerting is less than the weight of the block multiplied by the coefficient of static friction, right? So that is an example of steady state error. If you were trying to use that spring to get the block to the exact point where the force, uh, like to that exact center point, you would not be able to. You would eventually reach a point of steady state error. Do we always care about this? Maybe not. If we are at 30.1 degrees, I mean, depending on the scenario, that might be good enough. If we're trying to get to 30 because we just need to carry something over, like some obstacle or whatever, <laughs> then we probably don't care for 0.1 degrees above. But there's probably some threshold of accuracy we do want, so steady state error can be a problem. So how we eliminate that is we add another branch in here. We take the integral of the error with respect to time. <coughs> this one is, this one's a bit more intuitive. Why the integral? Again, multiply by some constant. Why do you think an integral might work to solve this problem? Okay, look, look back at the graph. Uh, this is a graph of the error, so this value, uh, with respect to time. Why might it, uh, taking the integral of that help? Specifically look at <coughs> this point onwards where we enter a steady state error. What can you tell me about the proportional term there? Uh, the proportional term is just error. So what can you tell me about the error after this? It's constant, right? So if the error is constant, then uh, obviously this term is not enough, but it's not going to change, right? What about the derivative term? It's zero. So that's not helping us at all. But if, we ha if we're taking the integral of this, that's not, the, because the error is, not zero, the integral is going to accumulate over time, right? 
Uh, so that term will actually grow uh, until this produces enough voltage to move your arm to the target. Now, typically, th so this system what we have right now is called the PID control loop. PID standing for proportional integral derivative. It's the most common building block of uh, feedback loops used in robotics. Um, but th this is a very pure representation of it. Uh, often you'll have other um, maybe considerations. One common thing is you might say, okay, here is like say plus or minus some, let's call it alpha. Plus or minus alpha uh, is where we think we have, we may have a problem with uh, steady state error. The issue with the issue that you can very easily run into with the integral term is if integrating that over that amount of time uh, is, gives you a large enough number to have a significant effect on the movement of the system. What do you think integrating that will do? Be huge, right? What, what uh, we will often do is we'll say, okay, the integral term is, um, first of all, if we're outside of plus or minus alpha, so if the absolute value of the error is greater than alpha, it's the integral term, we just call it zero. If, um, and then once we re-enter, it starts integrating again from the zero. So if that, uh, mathematically, in this case, uh, we would be taking if I extend this out, we'd be taking the integral from, not from zero, from here to the current time of the area under the graph, right? There's a fourth term that we can add in here that we do sometimes. Let's go back to the scenario where we have an arm that's trying to get to a certain position. In this case, we treat up and down movement the same, right? Physically, are up and down movement the same? No. Because when you're going down, gravity's assisting you. When you're going up, gravity's working against you, right? So the same, to achieve the same uh, physical result, moving up versus moving down a certain, like, like the, basically if you were to take like moving from 30 to negative 30 versus moving from negative 30 to 30, it's not just, and to produce the exact same motion in opposite direction, it's not just a matter of flipping the sign of your voltage, right? If you were to apply um, like 10 volts up on a motor, for example, that would move it at a certain speed with a certain mass on it. Apply 10 volts down, it would probably go a lot faster, right? So, roughly, figure out how much voltage is enough to just hold the arm where it is. Because if you turn off power, odds are, if you build it properly, there's probably not going to be enough friction to hold it where it is, depending on what this mechanism is, what it's holding, etc. So, you figure out what voltage you would need to hold the vertex. Maybe that's dependent on the angle, because, I mean, if you have an arm that's here, with a certain mass on it, an arm maybe at like 60 degrees above horizontal with the same mass on it, the torque applied by the mass here is a, lo is a lot more than the torque applied by the mass here, right? So, maybe, uh, maybe that voltage needed to just hold it where it is is dependent on the uh, on the angle of the arm. But anyway, you come up with some function of of the sensor, not of the air, but of the sensor to determine. Um, I'm just going to call that F for now to determine a certain voltage, and you also add that. So that means your basic that's your thing saying this is counteracting gravity. This is just me trying to account for the fact that gravity is helping me when I'm going down and not helping me when I'm going up. And that will also help you avoid steady state error. Does that make sense? Cool. And this we call a bias term. So we're biasing it towards, like we're giving more power to upwards motion and downwards motion because that counteracts the other physical forces on the system. We'll just call this, for simplicity's sake, We'll call that block a PID block, okay? So, let's go back to one issue that we talked about uh, with the derivative term, which was momentum. 
what if we want to have even more control over that? So we want to directly be able to control the velocity of the arm. So what that comes down to is coming up with a proper set of um, target and input values for the PID. So maybe, so what, what we've kind of done here is the input value to the PID, right, was um, in this case the position of the arm, right? But if we want to control velocity, then we want to have a PID block um, where the input um, is the velocity of the arm, right? But we have to do something else here. <coughs> because now, um, what are we going to configure the target of the uh, velocity PID loop to be? Because our target value here is the target position of the arm, right? So we can't just plug that in as a target because sort of an implicit assumption here is that these are the same, not just the same units, but rep or, yeah, they are the same units, meaning they're representing the same, uh, the same like quantity, the same type of quantity. That's the current value. This is what you want it to be. So we can't just give a target position and say, here's the current velocity. Do your thing, right? So I mean, we could do something like. Um, maybe subtract the target from, yeah, subtract the current value from the target, so the further away, the faster we want to go, the closer we are, the slower we want to go. <coughs> maybe multiply it by something. Maybe build that whole thing up again. We can do that, right? You have a PID loop running to that has some output and trying to control uh, the position of the arm. That output is presumed to be a velocity that you want the arm to move at. So you use that with another PID loop to, move, to try to move the arm at that velocity. Now note that when I say PID loop here, that doesn't mean both of these loops need to have a proportional integral, derivative, and bias. <coughs> in some cases, those coefficients might make sense for it to be zero. So in this case, especially for example, um, a derivative term might not make sense because that means the target velocity would directly depend on the current velocity. So the faster we're going, the slower we're going to tell it to go. That doesn't really make sense. So maybe we'd exclude the derivative term here. Maybe even just exclude the integral the term as well and just call it, maybe that's just a proportional loop. So maybe it is just a subtraction with a multiplication by some coefficient. But the point is to conceptually that this is a uh, controller, uh, a feedback loop based on the, uh, the difference between the current value and the target value. Does this concept make sense? Yeah. That's called cascading the idea. So it's a PID which outputs a target for another PID. I mean, hypothetically, you could like compose this with another PID loop and go further. I don't think I've ever seen a scenario where that would make sense. But um, in principle, these are tools that can be composed together to create whatever type of controller makes sense for the system that you're working with. <coughs>